Our next speaker is uh, Greg Munden. Uh, he's uh, president of Munden Ventures Limited, a family uh, locally owned uh, business here in Kamloops. It's a business that's involved in the logistics, harvesting and transportation of forest products. But particularly what is of interest to me is uh, he has a keen interest in making trucking and forest industry more attractive to our youth. And I think we all know we're having uh, a tough time getting youth interest in our, inter so he, in our industry. So what uh, Greg is working on is projects that bridge that gap. And apparently we're going to hear some of that in this presentation. Now, Greg, where are you? Greg Munden, thank you very much. Join me in welcoming Greg. All right, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction, Nick. Uh, what you all quickly discover is I'm not a presenter. They've got me in the presenter category, but I'm a, I'm a contractor. And, uh, you know, I was asked to speak by Trish here, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I've, I've, I spend a lot of time working on, on the driver, I guess the driver situation, uh, both in my business and, and as well in the association work that, uh, that I'm involved in. So, it, you know, in my mind, the, the plight of the contractor uh, and, and, the, uh, and the professional driver is, is probably one of the most important issues I think our industry will face over the next decade. I think it's more important than the soft lumber agreement, uh, than the reduction in annual allowable cuts, uh, the implementation of electronic logbooks, and all, all of the other things that are coming down the pipe. And with this issue comes, the, I think, the really real risk that uh, safety concerns are going to grow in an industry and in a sector that really struggles, uh, particularly in the logging side, as you all know. You know, we're often under the microscope, uh, and, and we really have trouble to both improve our track record and, and improve our public perception. So I'd like to, uh, like to talk to you a bit about these things today. Um, I, I know the, uh, the, the heading was attracting new log truck drivers and training for a safer driver. I, I changed that without permission um, to uh, professional log truck drivers and the looming crisis and, and the looming safety crisis that I think, uh, because I think it's that important. So I, hopefully I know how to operate this. This is, as, uh, this is as, as often as I get up here to run one of these things. There we go. So, um, so the current situation, the, uh, from an economic standpoint, much of the population in BC I think is pretty happy with uh, the current situation. Most people are completely unaware of the professional driver crisis that is developing and which will affect everybody at some point in time and soon. Because we like to say in our industry, if you got it, it came by a truck. <clears throat> so our economy is very near what, uh, what would be considered full employment. Unemployment rates are obviously very low. Most people that are interested in working are working. I guess I gotta click this as I go. It's working now? Yeah. All right. Um, you, you know, there's as many people working today in high tech in BC as there is in forestry, mining, and fishing combined. Tourism's exploding, manufacturing's stagnant. I'm really gonna get this thing working at some point. Don't, uh, don't press in the middle break, press on the right. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm too short, that's my issue. <laughs> too far. Too far. Uh, you know, retail is under siege, manufacturing stagnant, and yet there seems to be few people to fill positions, and that's in any sector, not just in trucking. But it's particularly difficult in trucking, and especially for professional drivers. When we used to have a position come open and be lucky enough to get 10 or 15 applicants, today we're lucky to get a few, and we're even luckier if there's a couple of them that are actually qualified to do the, uh, to do the job. So to paint a picture, last year in BC, there was an estimated 1,700 drivers that the industry was short. 12 months later, that number's 4,000. I'm sorry, I can't see this. 
Trucking is currently short about 52% of the new and replacement positions that, uh, that come open. Between 2017 and 2027, BC is estimated to have 917,000 jobs to be filled, but there's only 438,000 young people expected to enter the workforce. So there's a huge gap. Between 2021 and 2017, Truck, transportation and warehousing is expected to need 20,000, over 20,000, about 20,500 uh, new workers due to growth and about 41,000 additional workers due to attrition. We can't fill 4,000 positions right now, so that's a problem. And really what's worse is we talk about 438,000 young people entering the workforce. Well, trucking attracts virtually no young people today. So the 438,000 really doesn't do a lot for us at this point. I was at a West Fraser safety meeting uh, earlier this week. You know, we had about 60 people in the room. It was a trucking, uh, trucking focused safety meeting. And they asked for a show of hands of how many were under, under 30. And I think there was two in the room. So that's a, a pretty good indicator and probably pretty typical of most uh, licensees uh, contractor profile. So why are we in this situation? Well, there's, there's lots of factors. Um, our workforce on average is older than virtually all other sectors. We do not have a culture of mentoring young people. We have non-competitive terms and conditions of employment. So our length of the day is typically, commonly can be almost twice what the average worker's day is. Uh, the industry is not typically paying overtime to its people. It's typically a productivity-based pay, percent of what the truck makes, for instance. Uh, we have little to no flexibility. Our schedules are fixed based on cycle times, so it's either a six-hour day or it's a 12-hour day or it's a 15-hour day is what tends to happen. And uh, truck owners don't tend to be, uh, don't tend to like six-hour days. We've got a bunch of unpaid, unrecognized, and unappreciated time that drivers put, put in. And there can be a lot of away from home time. In terms of, uh, in terms of public perception, uh, we aren't popular. Uh, big trucks are scary to people that are outside the industry. We hold up traffic, uh, and we cause accidents, regardless of the circumstances we're viewed as causing accidents. So like every industry, we've got, certainly have our share of drivers that aren't living up to the standards we'd like them all to live up to. We've got companies that are not giving drivers the opportunity to live up to those standards. But we've got a whole bunch of companies that are doing, doing really good things and being painted by this, uh, by this same brush. The other thing is, is we have really poor prospects for future employment. I mean, we talk about uh, the, the big buzzword right now is autonomous trucks that is really hurting our industry. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about autonomous trucks and, and, and kind of my view of what's really happening as far as the autonomous trucks goes. So anyway, you can, you can imagine how kind of our recruiting goes. And, uh, you know, I wanted to show, we're looking around for a video that might kind of, might kind of give you an idea of when we sit down to talk to a millennial about going into our business. And this fellow kind of says it all. The 40-hour uh, work week was, was his first time job, part-time job. Amy, it says you are trained in technology. That's very good. Are you adept at Excel? No. PowerPoint? No. Publisher? Not really. Exactly in what area of technology mm -hmm. are you proficient? <laughs> Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, Vine, Twitter, you know, the big ones. I'm surprised you didn't say Facebook. <laughs> That's for old people, like my parents. <laughs> That's funny. Well, Amy, when you're working for me, you have to have those kind of research skills because I'll send you things for you to comb through and get the answers and send them to me. So for that, you've got to be really good at technology. For stuff like that, no problem. I'll just ask Siri. You, you'll just ask Siri? You know, Siri tell me this, Siri find me that. We're all good getting you the answers. Tell Siri I want you ready to go at 8 sharp 
each and every morning? I don't understand. What don't you understand? What you just said. You don't understand? Be ready to go? No. You said eight, right? Yes. Eight like in the morning eight? Yes, in the morning. Yeah. That kind of doesn't work for me. Who gets up at eight? I do. I Skype with my French boyfriend in Paris until like three in the morning. I don't even get to Starbucks until like 10 where I order my grande chai tea latte, three pumps, skim milk, light water, 2% foam, extra hot, but not too hot. So if it's okay, I work best in the morning at 10.45. <laughs> wow. Amy, I don't think we're gonna be a good fit. Why are you so negative? I can sense your hostilities and right now I am not feeling very safe. I've been here for over five minutes and the only nice thing you have said to me was nice resume, which I typed all night for this meeting with you. You've given me no guidance, no validation, no encouragement, no supervision. Is there an HR director somewhere? HR director? Yes, I need to speak to someone. I may have to take off today as a mental health day. Take the day off, you, Amy, Amy, look at me. You don't work here. Are you firing me? Okay, yes. <sighs> but uh, I, I think you get the point. I mean, we're all struggling with uh, how to attract millennials. <laughs> And uh, you can only imagine how our industry looks to applicants if that's an issue. So, so, so what are the risks of not, uh, not coming up with some solutions for this? Well, I, I believe that companies, if they haven't already, no, now this thing's really going to work. Uh, companies, if they haven't already, are going to have a real inability to fill seats. Uh, I know a lot of people and friends that I have in the industry are already experiencing this now. It's going to really force trucking companies to, oh boy, anyway, we'll go with it. So I think going to force trucking companies to downsize or it's going to probably put some in a position that they'll fail altogether. So at the end of the day, logs aren't going to get to the mill, lumber's not going to get to the customers. I would really like this. Or, um, in my mind, maybe what's worse is the alternative, that trucking companies are gonna start compromising their standards to keep trucks rolling. So their hiring practices that they've been trying to adhere to for a long time are going to, uh, are going to give way to economic uh, need to keep people behind the wheel. Uh, whether they're qualified or qualified to the extent that they normally would be or not, Licensees are going to be probably put in a position where they really need to extract everything they can out of the available trucks and drivers that they have, which really is probably going to inevitably lead to more people exiting the industry as opposed to staying in. And, uh, and at the end of the day, every likelihood it's going to lead to more incidents, more accidents. And I know that most licensee shareholders won't, uh, won't think too highly of uh, the more incident, more accident uh, proposition. So in terms of obstacles, we, we certainly have some to overcome. We've got to compete with a lot of other industries that on the surface have more opportunity to uh, change, their, change the way that their job is done, change their schedules, accommodate people more, um, and, and really cater to a generation that highly values uh, work-life balance, which as an industry, we've always had a tough time, uh, a tough time accommodating. You know, there's a significant lack of funding uh, for training programs for log truck drivers, and that's got to change. Uh, we've, we've got to open up opportunities for young people to get the training they need so that we can, we can bring new people in and confidently put them behind the seat. As far as, uh, as far as ICBC goes, uh, their licensing standards have to change. Uh, currently getting a class one license does, certainly does not make you qualified to 
I think operate most class one uh, trucks under any environment, and they and it particularly does not prepare you to drive a logging truck. So there's uh, there's no way we can take applicants uh, that that do not have another level of training and expect to put them in a logging truck and uh, operate safely and uh, according to the way that uh, both ourselves as contractors and licensees expect us to conduct ourselves. And the training standards that these driving schools are mandated to follow are, are just really the bare minimum. I mean, they're just, they're, they're the minimum entry level requirement to achieve a class one license and that's going to have to change. And as far as the, uh, a lot of people don't know about the NAC National Occupational or NOC code, but uh, currently professional driver is considered an un unskilled or low skilled job. Uh, why that's important is because the NOC code is the key to accessing government funding. You, you have to be a skilled or semi-skilled trade to be able to be eligible to get access to grants and funding to, uh, to put training programs together and to put students through training, whether it be through, uh, whether it be through uh, educational grants that they get themselves or funding that the government provides to put, put the program together to begin with. So the question then is what needs to happen? I hope I'm on the right slide. Yeah. I think the first thing we have to do is we have to move the bar in terms of respecting and appreciating and valuing the drivers that already work in this industry. You know, you may have noticed I, I try to always refer to uh, the people doing this job as professional drivers, not just drivers. You know, these are highly skilled people doing a job that requires a, a very unique set of skills and uh, a job that most people can't do. So to say they're unskilled or low skilled is completely incorrect and we really need to change that conversation. We need to start telling our story you know, it's a, it's a good story that we have. Uh, the industry's been very good to, to me and our family for three and now four, th four generations as my son's becoming involved. There's really good logging opportunities out there for people. And, uh, and the logging industry has some big advantages over other sectors of the trucking industry in that we have relatively good compensation because we hire the most elite drivers, or we intend to. Um, in many cases, they're home every night, uh, and in a lot of cases, we have dedicated work so we can provide consistency and, and drivers like to know what they're doing the next day. So we've got some good opportunities there. One of the things that's an absolute must in my mind is mandatory and entry-level training. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of work happening right now to improve the quality and availability of novice drivers. We need it to also raise the profile of the profession and to return some of the pride in the job and reaffirm from a societal standpoint that being a professional driver is a, is, is a valuable position and one that's respected. We need the industry to endorse and support the implementation of pending opportunities to raise the profile of the trucking industry and make advances in safety. So we've got upcoming changes with respect to electronic log books, to speed limiters, to what they call ADOS or advanced driver assistance systems. And those advanced driver assistance systems is, is really what you're talking about when you're talking about autonomous trucks. And it should be really referred to as a zero collision truck, not an autonomous truck. And I, and I like to use the analogy of the autopilot system in an airplane. When autopilot systems came into effect, it didn't do away with the uh, pilots uh, sitting in the seats. And it really will be the same with the autonomous truck. We need to start, stop using that term because people, are, people that might be in, interested in our industry view it as a short-term opportunity that uh, it won't be long in the future that they're gonna be replaced by a computer doing the work. And that will be from, from all the work that I do and the associations and, and guest speakers that we've had presented, this is years down the road. This is years down the road and it's, and it's probably decades down the road for a sector that's uh, really unique like the logging industry in BC. So it, there, there are things that are gonna change their job, but the, uh, the need for professional drivers is not going away anytime soon. We need that message out. 
And as, a, and as an industry, we need to be more creative in making the job more flexible. Um, you know, we need, to, we need to look at scheduling. We need to look at how we do that. We need to make it more rewarding and more reasonable. So we really need to work at starting to change the conversation with uh, people that might be interested in our sector. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is kind of the expression you'd expect from a driver when they're being pushed and, and uh, kind of encouraged to, uh, to make their logbook work. But really now this is the face of the fleet owner when he finds out that he's got to find a replacement driver for some reason. It's a, it's a scary, uh, scary proposition out there. And I guess the question becomes, you know, who's going to make this happen? This isn't going to happen, uh, this isn't going to happen for sure uh, with just the trucking contractors. This has to be a joint effort. We need prospective workers to place some value in the opportunity and the prospect of becoming a professional driver. We need licensees to recognize the importance of the professional driver, and I think, I think that, that is already starting to happen. But they need to be more thoughtful in how they plan for hauls, you know, the length of day, the proximity to where drivers live, how they're treated at the scales, how they're treated by supervisors. And, I, and in, my, in my mind, licensees are going to have to play a big role in helping to fund the professional driver training programs or in using their voice with government to make changes to allow access to funding. So they certainly have a, a, much, uh, a much bigger voice than the individual trucking contractors do. And the truck, trucking contact, contractors certainly share the responsibility. You know, we need to become better employers and we need to make the job better for the worker. We need to pre be prepared to invest ourselves in training and create mentorship opportunities for new drivers. And we need to pay drivers for their time. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have too much expectation that drivers, uh, drivers delays and, and things that inevitably happen out on the road become their responsibility and it's included in the rate. And that's going to have to change. And somehow we need to find a way to create some kind of a work-life balance for drivers because I think that's very important to the generation that's uh, looking for work right now. And as far as industry associations like BC Forest, Can BC Forest Safety Council, the ILA, TLA, BCTA, CTA, they need to lead the way in breaking down the barriers to access funding for professional driver training. They need to help develop the professional driver training programs, and I know that the BC Forest Safety Council has been quite innovative in developing a log truck driver training program, which I think has been being implemented right now on the island uh, quite successfully. I think it's uh, about a three-week uh, sort of academic uh, school-type session followed by about four weeks of on-the-job mentorship. and. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great program and one that we need to look for opportunities to roll out across the industry. And we need governments to create these educational funding opportunities as they do for any other skilled occupation. Um, people that are interested in this need access to student loans and they need to value the position to make them want to take a student loan to, to get it. And they, and they really need to, we have, a, we have a big problem with the graduated licensing program in BC. Uh, because of the graduated licensing program, students that are coming out of high school are not even in a position to start taking their class one or class three license until uh, oftentimes until they're 18 and maybe 19 if they didn't get their license when they first had the opportunity when they were 16. So we're losing, we're losing the opportunity to get these young people coming out of school training to become a professional driver because, well, their parents want them to work and they want them, uh, they want them headed down a path that, that actually can employ them when they come out the other end. And we don't have that opportunity to, to offer to them right now. You know, it takes an estimated $25,000 uh, to adequately train a novice driver. And, 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 that's, and that still makes them a novice driver. Um, it's going to take a community to create this driver pool that we're going to need um, and not the least of which is uh, the veteran drivers that we have because they're going to have to start being willing to mentor 
uh, and pass along their knowledge to young people. And I, I think that's a, a huge gap in our industry right now. You get, uh, you get a young, a relatively green person out on the hall roads with them, and uh, I don't think there's enough being done to help those people along. Usually it's an annoyance to the senior guys. They're slowing them down, they're causing problems, they're tying up the road because they do have a problem, and that's really gonna have to change. And certainly there's no way in my mind that the contractor can take this on alone. Uh, I, I don't know of any trucking contractor, including ourselves, uh, either in this sector or any other trucking sector that can afford to invest $25,000 to, to bring one student through a program to give, us a, to give us a novice driver that we're gonna all feel comfortable with. So it is going to take a joint effort to make that happen. And I just put up here a few elements of some of the MILT programs that uh, I've seen uh, in operation in various parts of the country. And these, these programs have either been adopted or being fast-tracked for development in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba right now. Uh, BC is absent from the conversation and that needs to change. Um, for sure, for sure some of the uh, some of the prairie interest in this is as a, as a result of the Humboldt uh, situation. Even though there's not a lot of information known about that accident, it, there's, a, there's certainly a perception that, uh, and in, that the fact that the driver was inexperienced is a concern and, uh, and they have raised the, raised the bar on this MELT entry level training program to, uh, to get that fast track, fast track through their regulation. So I guess what I want to leave you with is that there, you know, there's really no silver bullet to solving this uh, coming professional driver shortage. It's going to happen. Um, it's already happening in lots of sectors. Uh, the U.S. is experiencing it ahead of us. They're significantly short on, uh, on people, and it's happening in certain areas already in a big way in Canada. You know, steps should have been taken. This was identified 10 or 15 years ago. And really in 2008, when there was some energy around this, the economy uh, obviously went flat and it's really masked this issue for the last 10 years, but it's, uh, it's re-emerging and it's gonna be, it's gonna be very serious and, and we're very late to the game on this. So there is a role to play for you know, everyone in helping with this, including the general public in valuing what, uh, what the professional driver does uh, for, for industry, for communities, for, for uh, creating living conditions that, uh, that we all enjoy. Um, they're just trying to make their living, uh, often in less than ideal conditions. And I think a lot of people don't realize the groceries they have at the grocery store are from them, the gas that they have in the gas pumps is from them, the lumber at the hardware store, and on and on. So it's only by raising the standards improving the training and making the job better, that we're gonna have the best people behind the wheel doing the safe and responsible things that all of us wanna see. I'm terrible with this clicker. So failure to act right away, in my mind, is really gonna compromise trucking safety and a whole lot of other things as well. So thanks for your time, I appreciate uh, the opportunity.